Hello everyone, and welcome. I'm just checking my sound is working before I do an introduction this time. Can everybody hear me? <laughs> 
I have learnt from previous mistakes of starting to talk before checking the microphone. Lovely. Well, in that case, hello and welcome to a millinery studio livestream. My name is Ilona, I am a milliner based in London and today I am going to review some more books. This is part three of a four part series of reviewing all the millinery books that I have in my possession and hopefully you've all enjoyed the past two. This is the third one and then there'll be one last one and then we'll have to come up with some other live stream topics. So before I even start, if anyone has any ideas, pop them in the chat for me. Always open to your suggestions. I hope everyone's been doing well. Um, hi Rachel, hi Michael. I've got my laptop on the other side of me. Normally I look this way and now I'm looking this way so I don't know if that's a bit weird. But um, as usual, trying something new. How is everybody? I am doing quite well myself. Um, really missed making videos. You might be thinking, oh, you've not posted for a while. Well, at least it feels like I haven't posted for a while because I haven't actually recorded videos for a while. So I had a lot of kind of footage saved up because I knew that essentially ascot season and pre-wedding season is crazy time. It's like millinery Christmas. So I've spent the past three weeks essentially making a hat a day. Um, I've got blisters on my fingers <laughs> and on the days when it was too hot my thimbles kept falling off my finger so that was painful because I couldn't really use a thimble and I still had to make hats and that was annoying. But hopefully the hot spell is now over. It's now much cooler in the UK. Michael says, doing well, hope you guys are staying cool in London. Thank you, Michael. It's a lot cooler than it has been. My poor kitten was very, very exasperated, but she's fine now. She's now asleep, so hopefully no interruptions from the cat. Um, just while I warm my voice up, I bought myself a new tea mug. Doesn't it look fabulous? I love it. It's, um... It's a pattern very dear to my heart. It's the pattern from a carpet in um, a centre called the South Bank Centre here in London on the River Thames on the South Bank, which has a concert hall, concert hall called the Royal Festival Hall. And this is the pattern from it, which I think was designed in the early 50s. And I love it. It's the, um, I, I love it so much that I stenciled it onto um, one of the walls in my house in, in, in another room in my flat. But now I have it on a mug. So I'm really pleased with myself and today I am drinking Sencha green goji berry tea with a few ice cubes in it because it is still quite warm. Rachel says, love the kerchief. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I couldn't figure out a hat that would go with billowy sleeve blouse and this was this was the best I could come up with. It's um, It's got a horse on it. It's from Longchamp. Um, so, yes, there's been um, general millinery news. I, I know you're all here for books, but th things have been on my mind. General fashion news. I have noticed a shift in the fashion trends. So every decade there tends to be a shift. So this is why we tend to think of fashion decades as like you've got the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, 2000s, and so on. And a, a couple of years into the decade, so around the kind of... I mean, we're in 2022, the previous style shift, I think I would I would put it at like 2014. So the silhouette changes. And of course, if your fashion silhouette changes, we milliners have got to pay attention to the head silhouette. And so far, all I've managed to figure out is that the current fashion trend is long billowy dresses, which I think is a kind of left over from lockdown people wanting to feel comfortable and also it's hot so linens and light weave cottons work very well in the hot weather hence all these billowy sleeves and obviously wearing lots of fabric and covering up is going to protect you from hot rays of sunshine which is always preferable but the only kind of hats that tend to go with this are either ones with big brims which 
I like wearing hats, but big brims put me off a little bit because I always find them, like, I can see the brim in my periphery and I start feeling a bit funny, like I, I, like I want to swat away a fly or something because I can see a brim on my head. Um, and I'm not prepared to wear that indoors. Like I'm perfectly happy wearing little callow half hats indoors on a live stream because I love wearing callow half hats. But I, um, I really struggle with the, the concept of wearing a brimmed hat indoors does feel a little bit odd to me. So um, going for a kerchief today. Uh, Michael says cottage core, exactly. So th the way I am choosing to look at this and once again, I know you've all tuned in to listen to books, but let me just get this, this fashion system out of my system. What I think has happened is people really enjoyed dressing up during the lockdowns. And then there was a sub community of kind of vintage enthusiasts who got into cottage core and all the kind of Marie Antoinette, Chemise à la Reine, playing at being in a farm, that kind of environment, the kind of fantasy escapism element with the big billowy sleeves and the linens and the cotton muslins and everything you get associated with Chemise à la Reine. And then that transferred into the subsection of vintage enthusiasts who like um, Laura Ashley dresses from the 70s, I think. I, I don't know much about that decade in fashion, but again, um, billowy sleeves and and long dresses although what i don't think we've seen or maybe that's just no actually no i think we have seen this but a personal bias of mine is that the laura ashley dresses tend to be all like itty bitty patterns and i i don't suit itty bitty patterns i don't know just my complexion and things so um i kind of ignore that aspect of it and only focus on um what's it called just big block colors mainly black and white actually Usually I go for colours, but here we go, black today. Um, yes, and then and then that kind of Laura Ashley meets Regency, Regency core, everything core, cottage core, Bridgerton, smashed together, and here we are with billowy blouses and long maxi dresses, and they are fabulous to wear in the heat because it keeps you cool, it keeps you protected from the sun, and it's wonderful but now we've got to find the hats that fit and i think i've figured out a few things and i do want to do maybe a fashion hats roundup but it wouldn't be a very long video so um i'll see if i can get around to just quickly filming something for you guys to just condense all, all my thoughts into one because i've already got a few ideas of what could potentially work with dresses like this whether you're looking to dress yourselves because you know hats are fun or whether you're looking to dress someone who's come to you wearing one of these new fashions just to give you some ideas apart from the big brimmed hats but um i don't want to spoil anything yet so i won't i won't say i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna keep that close and then post a video about it hopefully hopefully i have time um so why why have i been making so many hats where have i been um i participated in a sales fair called london accessory week and i have a few opinions on that and there is a vlog coming hopefully next weekend so um i know rachel rachel who is one of the moderators in the chat today everyone say hello to rachel from the youtube channel labricaloose um Rachel wanted to know how my fair went. Well, once again, I'm not gonna spoil anything. I'm going to save that for the video and um, yeah, you'll have to wait to see. But I spent three weeks making 42 hats in case anyone's interested about statistics. <laughs> right, shall we move on to books, the main event? Mm -mm. No, hang on, hang on, hang on. Okay, that's what's been on my mind. I, th th there is a structure to these live streams, I promise. The next thing I wanted to talk about before we get onto books, this is gonna be really quick, I promise, really, really quickly. Interesting millinery things that I've bought during the past month since the last live stream. So uh, let's switch camera views. Well, I'll start here and then we'll switch camera views. I went into a vintage shop looking for a wicker bag because speaking of these billowy cottage core dress things, um, lacquered leather handbags don't really suit the look. So I was thinking, okay, I need a wicker handbag. And I went into a vintage shop looking for a wicker handbag and I came out 
with a crochet hat <laughs> with a with a little dome on the top it's really cute let me pop it on and i want to do a kind of i, I don't know whether to wear it straight or i don't know whether to like tilt it what do you guys think so this is tilted and then this is straight i don't know um but it needs a spruce up it's it's a little battered it's not very worn which is quite lucky let me switch camera views there's something very turkish about it um oh, i don't have the book next to me do you remember the book from one of my previous live streams that was um the mode in rachel says tilted the mode in hats and headdresses and that had um like fashion plate illustrations by the author of hats from different cultures and while this is quite kind of 40s and 50s um everyone's saying tilt it thank you <laughs> you see my instinct is to just put it on straight because i always put everything on straight but everyone says tilted so we'll keep it tilted there we go um i think as as well as looking very 40s and 50s obviously because it's a vintage hat it it's also got something very turkish about it with the little with the little um i don't know what to call this like a, a spoke a spire like a church spire maybe um yeah uh let me switch camera views let me show you the inside because this is quick preview or well i'll show you close up So close up, the, all these flowers, they are so flat. They need, they need some TLC. In fact, what I would probably do is completely take them off, deconstruct them and see if I can create a pattern and then use flower tools to create these shapes again. And it's got these wonderful stamens. Look at these, aren't they so cute? These little long stamens. I'm not a biologist, I don't know the uh, the uh, name of this kind of stamen, but I, I think it looks like little mini peppers. So that's what I'm calling these, little mini pepper stamens. And then these um, leaves made of this, I, I, I don't know what this kind of fabric is. I've seen it on quite a few other millinery um, flowers. It's kind of waxy on one side and then not... It's, still kind of almost like an oil cloth but i doubt it's real oil cloth that would be weird to make leaves out of oil cloth right or maybe we should try that maybe maybe that's an interesting live stream um so flowers made out of weird fabrics and then we can see how they behave with flower tools because who knows maybe oil cloth would work or like a highly waxed fabric, although surely the tools would melt the wax. Anyway, we'll we'll discuss that in, in that video if anyone's interested. Um, and also, I think it's missing a leaf. It's definitely missing a leaf because it's got these little uh, 15 millimeter Petersham bows, which are very, very sweet. And then they've got, uh, four, it's got four bows. And then under each bow, it should have a green leaf, which some of them are completely falling apart. And then this one's missing it. So it needs extra, an extra leaf there. But I will, I will go through it. And this is a crochet hood. Um, and I don't know if maybe it would have been crocheted into the shape to have the little steeple on top or whether actually I could get away with maybe cloning this shape. Um, so like, I, like in my Beau Batons hat video, where I added a little triangle tip to a crown to create the pointy shape of the Beau Baton witch hat, maybe this could be achieved as well. It, it definitely that would work for felt, but I don't know whether it would work with a crochet hood, so maybe I'll try that at some point as well. But I don't have any crochet hood hats, so this is fun. And I will leave the inside explanation for when I actually do um, the video on this hat, because... I think it deserves a whole 10 to 15 to 20 minutes of of the starring role, not as part of a live stream. So there we go. Little hat. There it is. Right. One last thing before books. I was browsing through some hat supplies. And I came across these little hook things. Look at these. Aren't they weird? And they're called... I've written it down because I wasn't going to remember. Pugery, Pugery, Pugery. I don't know how you pronounce this. Um, 
I, I would guess Pugari. Let's let let's go with Pugari. Um, hat hooks. So what you're supposed to do is, for example, a hat like this one, this this big tilt hat. Speaking of hats that go with, oh, where's the back of this one? Speaking of hats that go with billowy blouses, hats like this. So anything with a brim. But again, I can see that in my peripheral vision, and that's annoying. But anyway, um. Hats like this that have, when I say hats like this, not necessarily with the brims, but that have a band of silk running along. So this is a um, bias cut piece of silk dupion, and I've stitched it down, but when I try to look up what you would use these hooks for, it's attaching scarves like this to hats. So you'd hook, I think you'd hook one on one side, and then one into the other, and you'd kind of pull it across. Anyway, that's something for me to... Um, Something for me to explore. Ah, uh, Rachel and Anissa in the comment uh, in the chat is saying that um, it looks like glazed cotton. I'm assuming that's the that's these little green leaves here, glazed cotton. Okay, glazed cotton. I shall remember that and keep an eye out for that in the fabric shops and see if I can get my hands on some because I've never heard of that. But we can try it. Right. So there we go. Pujeri hat clips. Maybe a. A quick short video once I figure out how to use these as well but they're very interesting very much feels like a time-saving device you know so if you want to cut your costs oh and speaking of like you know how the fair went and stuff I will say one thing is it put a few things into perspective for me the main thing being, I prefer making videos and live streaming on the internet about hats for you guys than actually selling hats to people. So, I kind of learnt my lesson. <laughs> so I will be back to making lots of videos. I have so many ideas for videos, not so much for live streams. So I need your help for live streams. So um, if you're just joining in a little bit late, you've not missed you've not missed the books yet. So um, hello everyone who's just joined. Um, leave me either a comment afterwards if you're watching this video later or put it in the chat if you've got any ideas for future live streams because this is the third live stream and we've got a fourth one to finish off. Right, books. Let me pop on my glasses. I've been staring at the computer so much um, that I should really read books with my glasses. Um, the first book on the list, I know I've put them in a specific order in the description box, but I'm actually going to do them in a slightly different um, different order, uh, just because I think it, it makes more sense. So in, in the past I've done um, books in the kind of publication order, but this time I'm going to do them in a more kind of organic order. Um, it makes sense to me. So anyway, um, what are people chatting about? Michael says the general public can be exhausting. Do you know what? I love chatting to the general public. Um, I, I just like telling people about hats and stories about hats and how they're made and history of hats and um, I, I, I couldn't help myself. I gave, I gave people insights into Edwardian millinery practices at my stall. Um, didn't, didn't, really, uh, didn't really help with the hat sales, but you know, I had fun. <laughs> and Anissa says, um, it is not easy to interact with customers, but you're doing great, don't mind them. Well, you see, the customer interaction was the easy thing. It's the sitting around behind a table um, that was kind of a little bit boring, I have to say because I, I do love the interactions and I I don't really have a problem with selling things or anything like that. Like, I, I get it. I, I like being behind a stall, but I missed filming videos. I really missed filming just either simple tutorials or um, I have so many other ideas on my mind of how to do, like um, I was trying to do a series called Hat Makers React. So um, if you haven't seen that one, please go and watch it. It was a lot of fun to film and I hope to do more of those and the particular one, the Hat Makers React, um, I got Rachel to come on and talk to me about the Kentucky Derby hats and we ranked, well we didn't rank them, we, we commented on some of the hats and what we liked and what we didn't like so maybe husband um, who is moderating the chat for me um, can pop a link to that in the, in the chat so that people can go watch that afterwards. Right, 
books. I am firmly on to books now. Right, first book. It's this one, Flower Making by Clara Kebbell. And I believe it was published in 1951. So this is quite an old one. And what I like about this book is firstly, it's really, really small. So it's not a book that you're going to feel overwhelmed with reading. So in the past, we had a look at some um, textbooks, which can be quite heavy on the wording. This is nice and quick. I think this was actually part of a series. Oh, it says here, it was part of a series called Make It Yourself Books, which I think is rather fun. We don't really get things like that anymore. But um, what essentially, it's just a very basic beginner's what you need for flower making and what it entails. Now, obviously, sorry, I'm just focusing the camera. There we go. Um, obviously, this is from the 50s, so these tools aren't electric, but you can see it's using pretty much the same set of tools that we have now. And this is very much the European style of flower making. So you've got the Japanese style and you've got European style and you've got different types of tips. And we did talk about that during one of the first live streams, which I think was called um, Real Time Rose or something like that. It's the one with the orange rose in the thumbnail. In fact, in the best Blue Peter fashions, here's one I made earlier. So when we were making this rose on the live stream, um, and this book helped me kind of gather my thoughts in how I was going to present it. Um, Kahlo says, oh, I've got that one in my eBay cart right now, just waiting for payday before I hit buy. Brilliant. I think you'll really enjoy this one. It's so good. Just, um, just bear in mind it's not very in-depth. So let me show you how it's not really very in-depth. And it's a, you, you kind of need to read it and then try things. Um, uh, Michael says an OG for uh, an OG for dummies book. Do you guys have that series in the, UK? in the UK? Yes, we do. And actually, I have been looking into um, <laughs> buying the accounting for dummies book because I need to do some accounting and I think I've made some mistakes and I need to I need to understand what's going on in in my accounts. Anyway, um, that's that's another conversation. Um, my husband Matthew says you'll have to explain Blue Peter. Oh. Um, yes, sorry, uh, for, for the Americans in the, in the chat and, and maybe the Europeans as well. We used to have a program here in the UK and I don't know if we, I don't know if it's still going on, husband. You, you might be able to explain this better. But it was called Blue Peter and they, it's a children's show, like a children's, like, um, yeah, just a children's show where you had some presenters and they'd go and do some interesting bits and they had a dog and they would do arts and crafts things and they'd start doing a tutorial and obviously instead of waiting for something to dry because they're filming they would just say and here's one i made earlier and pull out like a painting or something from under the table so there we go that's my blue peter explanation so let's have a look at the instructions for this rose this is why i got this book it's these diagrams, which I find exceptionally helpful. So actually reading the book, um, I didn't find very helpful because firstly, it's in inches. I don't do inches. We all know I'm a metric girl. Um, so, you know, this kind of one and a half inches, two and a half inches, three inches. I still have to convert that in my head because I just don't, I, I don't understand inches. But it is useful for, so for example here, we will make as our model a rose with 20 petals. So that gives you an idea of maybe what you could aim for. I personally choose to ignore this information and just use the Fibonacci sequence. So instead of making a rose with 20 petals, you could go for 21 if you were doing um, singular petals in a rose. But if, if uh, so this one isn't 20 petals, this one is, uh, Four times one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Wait, uh, four and four. Eight times four. Maths is not my strong point, but this is eight times four petals, this particular rose. But I don't think that's 20. Right, so these diagrams. It will show you how to, so the, the kind of shapes you're looking for. I wouldn't say these are particularly accurate patterns, but what you can do is just scan this in with a scanner or just take a photo on your phone, enlarge it, print this off, and then you've got the, 
the pattern shapes. And um, thanks, husband, 32. Thank you. <laughs> 32 petals in, in, in this orange rose. And it's then showing how it's using the ball tool on the inside. And then it's using um, like a stick or a tweezer. I don't have my tweezers next to me, but just long, long, thin tweezers or a stick to roll the edges. I, of course, did it differently. So it was good for me to have this information and to see how someone else would have done it. But I think, again, this kind of proves that there's so many different ways of doing the same thing and achieving a similar result. Perhaps not the same because their rows, it looks, it's more like this one here. So it, it is a very different style rose, but I don't have time to fiddle with tweezers to do this on every leaf. That's, that's too much effort. I'm, I'm all about efficiency. So I was, I wanted to do it my own way with the tools. So there we go. Other flowers in this book? Uh, oh, hang on. The rose is one of the end ones. Flower stalks. Oh, it's also got a good book on stamens. So this is very helpful, this stamens page. So for those of you looking to get this book, um, the stamens page you'll find very helpful. Again, just extra ideas of how to do things because you, it, it's one thing to look at a real life flower and think, okay, how can I do this? What's my creative process? But as at the same time as doing that, it's really helpful to go and have a read or have a listen to someone who's done it before and see what conclusions they came to because then you've got a rounded set of information um, to follow to help you. So it's got a poppy, it's got a rose, what's this, a, uh, a daisy, daisy, look at that, isn't that pretty? Uh, once again, I have a slightly different method of making daisies, this isn't how I would make a daisy. Um, perhaps that's a live stream that you guys want, just how to make daisies, I don't know. Uh, let me know, buttercups, that's a giant buttercup. <laughs> and then it goes into some weird things, it goes into like um, uh, paper mache flowers. Again, that feels like an awful lot of effort for, for a hat, but maybe that's relevant if, if you wanted to make anything out of paper mache. I think they'd, they'd still be quite light. Um, and then at the end, it goes into different ways that you can use these flowers. But obviously, we're interested in hats. We're not interested in all these other methods. So, um, yes, there we go. Oh, Rachel says... Um, this appears to be a very rare book. Only one copy is available on alibris.com, which I'm assuming is an American-based bookseller. I think because it's a British book, so I think if you're in America and you try and get this, you're probably going to have more luck if you are in the UK. So let me just check. Let me check the publishing information for you. It does feel like a very British book. Oh no, hang on, New York. Uh, published, oh, published in London and in New York. Okay. Printed in England. That's probably why. So even though it was published in New York, if it's printed in England, then m most of the copies that are left over will be in, um, uh, in, in the UK, probably. But, I mean, you don't have to buy every book I, I talk about in the stream, you know? It's, it's, it's not a case of I'm trying to sell you rare books. No, no, no. You decide for yourselves what you might like to buy or what information you want to get out of it because I personally don't think this is a necessary book to buy because the information in it is so basic and you will find the same information in this book regurgitated by someone else on the internet, not just me, but plenty of other people in, in videos, in blog posts, um, other more modern books that you can get your hands on, French flower making courses, or you could even ask your local milliner for uh, a course in French flower making if you're specifically interested in French flower making, um, and they should be able to help you out with that. Or, you know, maybe one day, maybe I have something in the works about French flower making. Who knows? <laughs> um, Right, next book. So, um, 
next book. We've done the flower, we've done the rose. Uh, fabric manipulation. Let's, uh, let's get this pretty, shall we? Fabric manipulation by um, Ruth Singer. Now, this book didn't turn out to be as useful as I had hoped. I bought it a very long time ago um, because I had seen another milliner and I cannot remember who it was. Maybe it was Jane Taylor, maybe, from London. She'd made this series of pleated headbands um, that the Duchess of Cambridge was wearing. This is, this is years ago. And I thought, that pleating looks very interesting. I want to know how it's done. Now, obviously, because this is someone else's hat design, I'm not going to go and copy it. I have no interest in copying other people's hats and selling them. But what I am interested in is different techniques and how these techniques are achieved and accomplished. And maybe if I try out this technique, I can find a different way of using it. And that's why I bought this book, because it's all about ribbon folding and fabric folding. It's even got smocking in it. So let's have a look at what I got out of this book. This page here is pretty much the only page that I found useful. And it is... Let's zoom out a little bit. Ooh. Oh, that's too far. Okay, here. Is that thin in focus? There we go. Uh, this is the only page that I found useful in this book. Uh, folding variations for basic box pleat. So essentially you, you, you get a ribbon or a strip of fabric, you make some box pleats, and then it's different variations of how you can do this. And this is great on um, like trilby, fedora, hat, um, uh, uh, ha uh, what's it called? Hang on. This bit. I've got a hat here. It's, it's useful on hats like this. So this is a winter hat. This is a winter felt hat. Here it is. It's a little bit big for me, but you see this trim here. This is a folded ribbon that I used from that page that I've just showed you. So it's a box pleat variation with a corner to corner join. And this is made with an ombre wired ribbon. So let me show you a close up of this. And because it's wired, Is that focused? No. <laughs> there we go, I think. Because it's wired, it's really easy to join the corners together like this. And it's quite nice to keep them... Oops. Folding there. It's, it's, I thought it was quite nice to keep them quite textured and spiky. But you can, of course, sew them down. And that's from, from this book. So it will, it, it is very good at going through how to execute each pleat. So if you are interested in ribbon pleating and you have applications for it, this is the book for you. But if you're not interested in pleating, oh, so I think this is the kind of pleating that was on the um, Jane Taylor headband that I was talking about, uh, which I never actually got round to trying. I just kind of looked at it in the book and went, well, that's a little too complicated. I can't be bothered. So there we go. <laughs> what else has it got? It, it does tell you a few interesting... There we go. This could have some millinery applications. Uh, so I think that's a project idea ripple brooch. Different kinds of shapes and folding. Look at that. That's pretty cool. Oh, there we go. That shape is, is pretty cool to try and do. Again, not sure what the application would be. Although actually it's round, you could imagine this on the top of a pillbox or a button hat. So if you took some silk and you stiffened it and then you folded it into the shape and then you stretched that over a button, button, uh, like a medium sized button. So like a 15 to 20 centimeter diameter button, that could look pretty good. And then it also goes into smocking. Now this doesn't really, I, I couldn't think of much in the way of hat applications, although... Rachel, you've been doing some series on Regency bonnets and I think some of them look like that's incorporating these kind of smocking techniques maybe or at least some kind of gathers but this could be an interesting exploration into, into that. Oh, look at that. Bubble cushion. Oh, imagine this on a hat actually. Okay, I've changed my mind. This does have hat applications. But um, yeah. Uh, and then it goes into like 
quilting things and and things like that so um yeah oh this is fun look at this that's very fun i mean i, I could almost imagine this on a handbag or on a brim like a giant 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 brim and then this kind of work all the way around again that's too much effort for me to do but maybe um maybe someone who has more time could give that a go so that was fabric manipulation by ruth singer and this one was published in 2013 so quite a recent book um i've got quite a lot of modern books coming up today compared to some of the previous streams oh right Mm. Take this hat off. It's a winter hat. It's very hot <laughs> in the wool hat. This is the last of what I'm calling millinery adjacent books. So this book is called Complete Pleats by Paul Jackson. Here it is. And you wouldn't strictly buy this if you're a fashion student. However, um, well, I mean, actually, well, it says on the front, pleating techniques for fashion, architecture and design. And you'd think, okay, well, maybe you want to pleat a skirt or something like that, and that's interesting. Um, but why would you look at this for hats? Well, let me see if I can open it straight on the page of the most fabulous pleated thing I have ever seen. Are you ready for this? It is fabulous. Right. Um, imagine this, but as a hat. How spectacular are those curves? And this is made out of paper. So if you took some Indian silk dupion and you stiffened it, either with a PVA stiffener or with a chemical stiffener, whatever your preference is, although for this kind of thing, I would actually potentially recommend a chemical stiffener, and I do have a video on chemical stiffeners, so that's when I reviewed um, some uh, chemical stiffeners from Belgium. So maybe husband, could you pop that into the chat for me? It's the um, it's the the video I think is called "This Stiffening Technique Will Revolutionize Your Workflow," which indeed it has. But anyway, that those chemical stiffeners on some Indian silk dupion, and then create this shape. So it will tell you how to go, how to get to this shape. So 2.6, chapter two, basic pleats, curved pleats, and then it will tell you how to do it in paper, but I see no reason why you couldn't do this in stiffened silk dupion. Um, I mean, it's, it's just fabulous. I haven't tried it yet because it does look very complicated. It, it starts you off early. So I think you're supposed to kind of approach this a little bit like a textbook, but I wanted to put it into today's stream, um, which is technically for full project instructions, but this is, I thought I'd start with the millinery adjacent book. So this is just general techniques to, to add to your library of knowledge in your head. Um, it does start with simpler pleats. And I figured, you know, maybe these can be applied to different millinery trims or even, um, just in general pleating, do you guys remember, I have another hat down here, do you guys remember this hat from the pleats video, this one? This is the pleated pillbox, um, and we made this one in the millinery bias secrets video, because all the pleats are executed on a bias, which of course with paper you don't have that problem, because paper does not have a grain, um, a grain line. Anissa asks, are you going to make a video trying this shape? Would you like me to? I could. I mean, that would definitely force me to try it. Maybe that would be, okay, fine, fine, I'll make a video. I'll make a video on trying that shape, yes. You can all watch me struggle and suffer trying to execute this. Um, and I mean, from the, from the photo, it looks like it should just sit on the head somehow, or at least like, um, like a tilted percher, like a, uh, on like a teardrop base or something, maybe that would look quite good. Okay, I'll try it. I'll try it. Oh, cinema might be good for this. Cinema might be good, but I think you'd have to like create some extra tools to get the um 
Because you wouldn't want to use a craft knife, which is essentially what's going on here to create the pleat. So um, any graphic designers out there will know that if you're trying to fold paper, you use the back of your scalpel on the paper, on the in a bit of the fold, you will get a, you will, I think in a bit, in or out a bit, oh dear, it's been too long since I've done any graphic design paper architecture, but you use the back of your scalpel to score the paper and then fold it and it creates the, the it, th this is how you get these lovely folds. So it must be on the inside of the fold, yes. Uh, oh, whoopsie. <laughs> One second. Please come back, camera. There we go. Lovely. Refocus that. There we go. We're back. Um, so yes, with Cinema, obviously I couldn't use a, um, a craft knife because you just rip the Cinema. And in fact, you probably don't even want to use that on paper. I mean, using... So if you've got quite sharp nails, so a nail like this, that would probably pleat... Um, fabric quite well if it's stiffened and hopefully it won't rip and as long as it's not wet the silk shouldn't rip either um but cinema how would you get that with cinema i guess steamer and maybe a piece of cardboard cut into oh well it does say to use a cardboard template so maybe if i was doing this with cinema i would just use the cardboard template and a steamer and Try and shape it around. I don't know. Maybe it won't work too well with cinema. We'll have to see. But this book takes you through everything. Oh, look at this shape. Look at that. So I th that looks like it's in fabric. But it, no, all this done in paper. And my thinking is, is if you're done in paper, if it can be done in paper, it, you should be able to do it in silk, right? Or at least that's how my brain thinks. Oh, look at that. That's so pretty. I've seen hats that look like this with brims. I cannot remember who did it. Someone did it for a competition and I can't remember if it won or not, but it was really, really, really amazing to see this kind of, almost like a honeycomb, but in strips of biocinema. That worked really well. Um, I'm sure, if you saw this picture, I'm sure you've all seen it um, because it was quite a famous hat. Um, or at least I thought it was a famous hat because it was just so spectacular. Um, oh, everyone's chatting away. Uh, Rachel says, uh, I need to get this book and it seems to be much more available than the first one. Yes, it is. And in fact, um, I would still classify this book as a bit ancient because, <laughs> yes, it was published in uh, 2013, but what's this? Oh, it's a disc. <laughs> Who's got a laptop? W w that has a disk drive these days. That doesn't make sense, but I think um, it says containing 23 videos, free DVD of pleating techniques, which would actually be very useful because um, uh, th these look very, very complicated to achieve and they also look very fun. Oh, look at this vase. Um, but yeah, um, the CD-ROM or, or disk or whatever you want to call it in this day and age. Uh, yeah. Um, a little, uh, what's it, um, QR code, barcode scan or something that I could scan with my phone and takes me to a YouTube video would have been much more modern. Um, uh, Anissa says, I was fascinated by the video on bias pleats on the green hat. Um, I'm a pleat person. Yes. The, I'm a pleats person also. I absolutely love pleats. I don't have much clothing with pleats, but um, uh, I do like hats with pleats. I just think it's such a simple way of expressing yourself on a hat that has limitless possibilities of how you can do that. Um, um, Rachel says, if you do any book binding, a bone folder would work. Yes. I do have a bone. Oh, it's in it's in my other thing. I do have a bone. Um, I love I love using the bone for paper. Yes, I'm guessing on on cinema. Yes, it definitely would work. Good idea. Right, we shall again try and remember that. Actually, do you know what? I'm going to write that down because 
I, I have an awful memory. I cannot retain, um, I can't retain memories or much information in my brain. I, it's a, it's a, just, just a problem I have, so I have to write everything down. Um, use bone, uh, instead of scalpel on cinema. There we go. Thank you, Rachel. Great idea. Um, and then Angela says, hi, Alona and everyone. Sorry I'm late. I'll catch up later on replying. Yes, I, um, uh, yes, th these live streams, they do go up afterwards, after I've done the stream. They will be available as a VOD or a video on demand, and you can still leave me comments and I'll read them and I can reply there. Uh, Kello says, I prefer a disc over a single use code any day, to be honest. Oh, I don't mean like a single use code. I mean, like, you know, you get those um, QR codes that you can just scan with your phone and it will take you to, uh, um, to a web page. Like you see them on some on some shop receipts and things. Um, and Rachel from Labricaloo says those videos are probably now available on YouTube or Vimeo if the book have a publisher. I think th probably, but I haven't looked, but I'm guessing like, why would they make the videos for free if they want you to buy the book? So I don't think you'd be able to access them without having purchased the book, but... Um, so I hesitate to, like, say, go out and buy this book because I haven't actually tried anything from it, but I saw it on a... Um, on a someone reviewed it on a fashion channel and I saw it and I thought, you know what, I need this because I think it can have hat applications but I haven't gotten around to trying it. So I will try it, I promise. I will, um, Anissa, I will, I will make that video um, about, about the pleats and things at some point soon. <laughs> so here we go. And now that's all of the three, what I've chosen to call millinery adjacent technique hats. I am going to take a quick um, tea break to refill my new mug that I, I really, really like. And um, I'll pop on some intermission music. You might see an ad. The ads help me finance the channel and all the camera equipment. And if you'd like to help me even more with um, helping me finance the videos and live streams and things, there is a button where you can tip me directly through YouTube. I think it's called Give Thanks or something, and it's right under the video. So if you um, wanted to, that that option is there. Alternatively, I've also got a Patreon and a Ko-fi account for tips, and um, you can join me on Patreon as well if you would like to. And currently the top tier Patreons, which I think are called my Berry Hat tier, they... Um, they get to have video calls with me once a month and we chat about their specific hat project. So if you'd like to join us on those video calls, I am trying to cover various different time zones. So don't worry, you won't be left out. But anyway, quick tea break. I will see you all back here in about two minutes.
I am back. Just double checking the audio still works. Lovely. Everything is on track. I have replenished my tea. Mm. And I have also been informed that there is no thanks button under the live streams. There is a thanks button under normal video uploads. So if you watch one of my other videos and you particularly enjoy it, um, you can leave me a tip through YouTube there. Um, so in which case, if there isn't a give thanks button under this video, there is in the description box a link to all my various socials and also a link to my Ko-fi tipping account. So um, if you wanted to support me financially, then that's that's how to do that there. Anyway, let's carry on with the books. How is everyone doing? Enjoying today's book stream? Oh, I can tell I've missed being on camera because um, I'm really enjoying myself today. Thank you, everyone. I'm having a wonderful time. Right, next book. So these, uh, the last five books are not in publication order. The last five books are in, I would say the order in which I bought them, but they're not really in the order of which I bought them. But I did, this is one of the first books that I bought. This is called Hats on Head, Hats on Heads by Mildred Anozark, and I think it was published in 1990, so quite an old book. Um, this, this book is actually very dear to my heart, so I was recommended it by a lady who I ran into at the V&A, the Victorian Albert Museum in London, on like a, um, I think it was a, a history talk. And then we went to the members lounge and we got chatting and it turned out she just started making hats and I was just getting interested in making hats. And she said, oh, you should buy this book. And so I went home and I bought this book and I found it really, really great. So this is very different to the textbook style books that we've looked at in previous streams. This book is more project focused. So if you don't know what you are doing and you are a complete beginner, it's these kind of books that you should go for. Maybe not this one specifically, but I'm going to give you a choice of four books like this today. And as I switch cameras, husband, could you come and change the battery on the front camera for me? Wasn't that well timed? Here we go. Right, so we'll just we'll just stay on um, we'll just stay on this camera for now. So what do I mean by hats by project? Well, here we go. Look, right in the middle of the book, a project called Willow Whimsy, and she takes you through how to make a hat from start to finish. So a very specific hat, giving you very specific measurements. So essentially. Like one of my YouTube videos where I make a specific hat and um, I fit that into, you know, 10, 10 to 20 minutes, she fits it into a couple of A4 pages. <laughs> so here's some um, more ways of making a turban. This is different to how I made the turbans in the pleats video that I've already mentioned. Um, this is more similar to it, but this kind of bucket hat. So th this has got very much 60s style projects in it, even though it was published in the 90s. Um, it's also got very old fashioned photos that look like they were taken on a camera where the flash was turned on and there was not enough ambient lighting in general. I personally think that most of these hats actually look horrendous, but um, that's just my opinion. <laughs> Uh, but the actual instructions are good. She she goes through also like child's hats and things and then basic sewn hats, six section crown, that's very useful. This is very 60s, such like a, a bubble head there. Um, multiple radii bio strip beret. Haven't tried this one yet, but this is a very interesting concept to me, very mathematical. I do like the idea of mathematically constructed hats. Um, but I would need to take that slowly if I tried them. Here's, here's some more of these fabric covered hats. Um, this I tried my hand at. Construction of simple stitched hat 
from radii patterns. So the idea is, is that you, let's see, is there a finished diagram of these somewhere? Yes. Oh, there we go. This is, this, this is what I meant. Brim block construction from radii. So the idea is, is to get these kind of brims for, um, uh, bucket hats, uh, again, bucket hats very in right now, um, as was predicted by various fashion trend people, and I chose to ignore this. And if John is watching from JWH Millinery, he won't be watching live because he's in Australia. Um, a link to all the YouTube Milliners channels, by the way, in the description box. So if you want to have a look at all of us on YouTube. But if John is watching this, I'm very sorry I just mentioned bucket hats. I know you hate them just as much as I do. But um, yes, here is a basic bucket brim construction method. And the idea is, is that you've got these radii circles and you measure along the head circumference like it's got here and then you cut each one out so here it is you can see it illustrated here and then they'll have a like a a pleasing slant um on when you put them on a hat i tried this method it felt very long and convoluted so i gave up and i didn't bother because i actually prefer to drape brims like um uh, like like I spoke about in one of the other live streams, do you remember there was a book that was called From the Neck Up by Denise Dreyer? She had a method in her textbook style millinery book about um, draping brims and that's the method I prefer to this mathematical calculation one. But if you wanted to give it a go, this certainly seems like a fun afternoon or maybe that's just my idea of a fun afternoon. Um, what else have we got here? It had a very good introduction page, so the materials, even though there's no pictures, it's only illustrations, but this materials was very good for my beginner mind, so about five years ago. This 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 really put everything straight to as to what things are. And the other thing I like about this book is it's in both inches and metric, which is wonderful and fabulous, so I don't have to do conversions. <laughs> It goes through um, materials here, so felt hoods and cape planes and types of stitches. But once again, we've seen all this before in all the previous textbooks. So it's not, if, if you've gone and bought yourself one of those textbooks, you probably don't need this book. But if you are just getting started in millinery and you've stumbled across my channel and you're thinking, how do I start? This is a very, very good beginner book. Whereas all the other ones from the previous ones, um, they, they are more building on some basic knowledge once you've already tried your hand at something. Michael says, bucket hats are an unfortunate accident of history. <laughs> I love that. that. That is the most diplomatic way of um, putting across your emotions about bucket hats. Some other things I liked in this book, hang on, uh, let me get to, I should have, read, what, what have I bookmarked? Let me see what I've bookmarked. Oh, the berry. I've bookmarked a berry. So if you're interested in sewn hats, this book is more about sewn hats than other hats. But I am very interested in that first one that we mentioned, that willow whimsy. So a whimsy style hat isn't really like a hat, it just kind of sits on top of your head. So where did it go? Willow, there we go, Willow Whimsy. So a whimsy is something like this, uh, very popular for weddings and things like that. Um, so it's it's not really a fascinator because a fascinator is a very, I would say a fascinator in modern fashion history terms would be a kind of 90s thing you buy at Claire's Accessories. Whereas a whimsy is a little more purposeful. That's how I would put it. So something like this very popular with brides and this actually goes through how to make bridal veils and wire shape hats which I actually want to give a go there we go wire whimsy again um so do you remember I did that wire wire framed pleats um video on the the Mrs Maisel infinity loop hat so this was a great reference for that it tells you how to do something like that there you go, some fabric manipulations here with these uh, um, 
woven ribbons pleated together. Uh, not pleated. What would you call that? Tapestried. Tapestried together, we could call it. Woven together? Interwoven. There we go. Interwoven ribbons. Um, goes through styles of lace. Puffed extensions. Again, very 50s. But this, this is a very interesting style of hat down here. Um, it goes through millinery bows and... No, I still cannot tie a nice millinery bow and I have to look at the books to be able to do it. There's just something about bows that um, long-time viewers of this channel will know I really struggle with. <laughs> so um, I always need to have a reference for bows. There's just, like, I, I can remember all the stitches, you know, like, like, um, like muscle memory and fingers. I can remember all the stitches and how to do all that kind of thing without looking at a book because I've done it so much. But with bows, I can just... I, I never just seem to be able to pull it out of my memory. So I always need book references. And this is quite a good bow reference, even though there's only like two, two pages on it. Again, there's more information on all these things in the previously looked at textbooks, which I think we did look at in, I think it was number two. Anyway, it, it'll be listed in the description box. Um, but yeah. Oh, these are fun. Cubist roses, uh, cabochon roses, all these different ways of using fabric to make these little trims. So if you're interested in that kind of thing, uh, briar rose, this one's very sweet. I actually went through how to make something like this out of ribbons in one of my very early videos about, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, you see, I've been doing this for longer than a year now and I cannot remember the names of some of the early videos about making handmade flowers without tools, something like that. I go over how to make something similar to this. Not quite this, because instead of a rose, I made violets. Tula and organza petals, once again, we've, we've seen all this before, but there's just something about the information in this book and the way it is presented that the way my brain thinks found very easy to access. Um, and just to give you a flavour, let me read you out one of the, um, just a paragraph. Let's find a paragraph. So this is from the straw capelin section, halfway through a tutorial. Select a brim block, dampen the straw, place the straw over the brim block, in this case a ring block, pin the collar in position on the inside allowing 13 millimetres. Drawing pins are used. Mould the straw to the configuration of the block. Pin with drawing pins if there is enough surplus to cut away, otherwise use berry pins to avoid marking. Now I think that's exceptionally clear and exceptionally straightforward and no extra fluff, no extra things to think about, just very clear short sentences. Sentences that consist of, you know, um, 10 words maximum compared to some of the old books that were written in the 20s that were just floral language upon floral language, this is much more accessible. So, this is one of these. But again, I don't know how rare this is because it was published in the 90s and I don't think it's in print anymore, but here it's been. Hats on Heads, Mildred, Annals Arc, my first millinery book. Okay, next one. This is one of the more recent millinery books. This is Hat Couture by Mariana Yonkind, published in 2020. And I do hope I've pronounced that right. I think she is Dutch, I think. Um, so uh, it's, it's either Jonkin or Jonkind. I'm, I'm really sorry about my pronunciation. Perhaps I should have looked that up first. Um, but in any case, if you would like to purchase this book, um, the details and publication date and authors of all the books I've gone through are in the description box for all of the live streams. So this book, the big plus of this book is the production quality. So compared to some of the old books where the way I was reviewing them was more about how accessible are they? Is the language good and is the content good? And, you know, at that point, the kind of quality of the actual bookmaking, you know, it wasn't really a factor because they're vintage books, they're old and whatever. But this is full on modern quality book production. And it is really, really lovely. 
a nice soft touch laminated cover. Lovely pink mirrored in the text. Very good use of fonts. Whoever put this book together has done an amazing job. It is beautiful to handle. It is, I think, about the right size because you don't want something piddly. So if I just hold it up to my head, this is the size of this book. This is a good sized book to have on your table. In fact, if you're working from a book like this and you're trying to do a hat, obviously you're going to spend some time reading the tutorial first and then as you work through it, you're going to want to have the book to reference. If you bought yourself a book stand so that you could open up the book and have it kind of held upright on your table, it won't take up a lot of space on your table and it's really easy to reference and this is a great size book for that and in fact on the back here we have a, um, a picture of Marianne herself making the hat that's on the cover and I just th I this is one of my favorite shades of pink anyway the you know so if you're buying a modern book this is this is a pretty good option I've got three more of uh, two more other options coming up so don't 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 go and buy this one just yet make up your mind in a bit because the thing about the modern millinery books in fact I might as well just um, bring them all into shot and then we'll, we'll kind of go through them simultaneously because as we've already noticed with the hats on heads and the previous textbooks it's the same information over and over and over again it just depends on how your brain would like to receive the information so if you like short sentences and um, you can deal with not very many illustrations then you've got the hats on heads if you need something modern and you prefer to buy new books because some people don't like secondhand books that's fine um you might want to go for one of these more modern ones but they are all very similar the difference is is that they contain different types of hat projects um uh but uh oh sorry can't see the chat with the glasses on Barnaby says, great lip colour, very Sarah Paulson in Ratchet. Also love the channel and what you bring to the millinery community. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, it's lovely to have you here. Um, I don't think I've seen you before in a live stream, so welcome if this is your first one. Um, if it's not your first one, well, thanks for joining in in the chat. That's lovely. Um, and thank you. Yes, this is a, I um, treated myself to a new lipstick to match orange, orange things. I love everything orange. Everything is orange around me. Anyway, sorry, back to books. So the modern books. The other two modern books I've got are uh, Millinery, The Art of Hat Making by Sarah Lomax and Rachel Skinner. And this was published in 2017. And then this is the most recent one, Contemporary Millinery by Sophie Beale. And this literally came out a few weeks ago. And when I noticed it was coming out, I um, went straight away and bought it. And I actually pre-ordered it before it was published to make sure I could get it on the very first day so that I could have a look through it and um, give you my thoughts. Um, before we go into those two, just bear in mind that this is all now modern at the moment, but I will end on a very special, very rare vintage book. So don't, don't go away anywhere. Right. Hat Couture by Marianne Yonkind. This is great for those of you who need picture references and um, this is this is Marianne. She's um, she's very fun. She makes very fun hats. She goes through everything in a lot of detail. I don't want to give away too much by flicking through the entire book because that would be unfair. But to give you an idea, I mean, there's a lot of fluff at the beginning about who she is and what she does, which I did actually find very interesting reading through because, um, you know, it's, it's good to know about the milliners. That's always a plus. But look at this. This is these are the kind of hats she makes. I don't know if this is a in a tutorial in this book. I can't remember. But look at how fabulous that looks. It's like a turban with giant egg cup. Wonderful. The basic premise of this book is big couture hats that you see in fashion shows. So hats like this. So these kind of big hats. So if you're interested in that kind of idea of 
very interesting custom shapes. She will go through how she does specific things. Um, but she also does a few basic hats. So these are her basic fedora lines. And then she has some pictures of how she changes them up a little bit, which I think is very helpful because I think it's very, um, it's very easy to just think, okay, I have a block and I'm only going to use it in this way, but we should all try and push ourselves and you don't really need more than many blocks. So if you've only got one block, like a one fedora block, uh, one that does a brim and one that does the crown, um, I think this is a really good way to inspire you to see what other things you can do with different colours, mixing and matching and all that kind of thing. Um, one of the tutorials that I haven't seen in any other book is this one on using this kind of, uh, she calls it a backer scrunch hat with inner felt. I've seen this material before in shops, but I'm, I'm not quite sure what it's called um, in, in British shops. Uh, oh, I, I should say, this book is available in the Dutch language as well because I think it was written, originally written in Dutch and this is a translation, but the translation is very good. It's clearly a translation that has been done by someone who is a native speaker to both because it reads perfectly well. Um, yes, so, I mean, there's not really much else to say about this because... It's just your standard projects hat. Hang on, has she got an index of everything in this book? Oh, she's got a pattern at the back here. Okay, so this is an index of mentioned terms. But is there a contents page? Oh, she does go through tools as well. But again, all these books go through tools, you know. it's They are practically all the same. It's just... It's, it's more about, they're all the same but different. It's really difficult to choose between these three modern books. Um, but actually I do have a favourite. So I'm going to move on to my favourite. And I might be a little bit biased here and I'll explain why in a second. Um, but this, this, was, this was a good book but it is on the expensive side as well. So you might want to keep that in mind um, with all the projects that are in this but it is also the thickest so you do get a lot of um content for what you pay for right so that was hat couture i don't really know what else to say about it other than it is beautifully produced but actually i haven't referenced this one as much as much as i have um this next one that i'm going to talk about Ah, um, Matthew has figured out how you can show your support during the live streams. At the bottom of the chat, there's a dollar button you can click, allowing the, allowing you to super chat and super sticker. Um, I'm not really sure what that means, but um, it's there. <laughs> okay, right. How long have we been going? Okay, I should start to wrap up soon. So this is Millinery, the Art of Hat Making by Sarah Lomax and Rachel Skinner. And as I've already said, it was published in 2017. And I really, really like this book. Millinery needed a modern book. And I think this is that, you know, this is the modern equivalent of the 90s published Mildred Anozark Hats on Heads, you know, so, um, you know, one or the other. This one is definitely very modern, very now. Again, well produced. This cover feels lovely. Again, it's the same. It's laminated, just like the other one. But this text... Oh, this is a super chat message from Matthew. Oh, and it highlights in blue. Okay. Do I need to refund you that two pounds, husband? <laughs> Thank you for testing it, though. Um, anyway... The text, I cannot remember what it's called, but it feels nice and shiny, but the actual book itself is a soft um, coated lamination. Um, and on the cover, I really like the cover because from the cover you can see exactly what's going to be in this book. So you've got this pink felt cocktail number 
And then you've got these three little thumbnails of um, that looks like a piece of cinema, that looks like a veil with a fascinator, and that looks like a little straw button pillboxy thing. Right. Wonderful pictures, amazing photography, absolutely wonderful. And again, lovely font, a little bit of an introduction as to who the milliners are. And in case you are interested, why I might be a little bit biased, and that's because I did a course online during the pandemic with Sarah Lomax on making FOSS shape, um, making your own FOSS shape blocks. And I thought she was an amazing teacher. And I think that really comes across in this book that um, both Sarah and Rachel know exactly what they're talking about. It's really well written and it's really well presented. So let's go into what you get in this book. And also, by the way, I think this one is the most reasonably priced book as well. Fabrics and trimmings, felts, it goes through absolutely everything. Look, this is a really useful page, except for B, Paris Dior and Blocking Net. You can no longer buy this stuff, but never mind. At least it's immortalized in this book. She goes through um, they, I should say, both um, Sarah and Rachel, because I don't know what who, which section was written by who, but they both go through. Oh, and, and the stiffeners, my favorite subject, millinery stiffeners. The techniques, the stitches. But once again, we've seen all this before in all the textbooks, but if you wanted a modern book with good pictures compared to the old textbooks that have illustrations, this is the book for that because these pictures are really clear um, and really obvious. And the other thing I like about this book is that most of these hats are not necessarily block based. So the ones in the hat couture, the, in the, uh, the Dutch uh, Marianne Jonkind book, they are very much I have this block and this is how I use it. Or um, she does also go into how to create cardboard blocks, which is also a very interesting topic and very useful to know. Um, this book does not go into making your own blocks, but look at this. You can make this hat without even having a poupe head because this is, this is very, very clever, I think. But I, I don't want to give you all that information because... Um, it, that would be unfair. If you if you want to learn how to make these hats, go and buy this book. Um, there's this evening cocktail band. This is very simple. Look at this. Very modern. One... Okay, I have one problem. Not necessarily with, with this book, but with the millinery community. And I'm, I'm just going to air it now because it's been on my mind. Um, my controversial opinion on the millinery industry. Can we please stop taking photographs on hats on models that look like they're nude like this right this is totally unnecessary i mean we know she's dressed because she's wearing a bandeau thing we just saw that on on like this page look so so she is wearing a bandeau dress there but is this really necessary like to have the bare shoulders and the neckline why can't she be wearing a t-shirt because who wears hats naked unless you're Dieter Von Tees, in which case, fine. But your average person buying this book doesn't need to not wear clothes with a hat. Um, and I have noticed this is more of a kind of European thing on the continent that um, certain hat competitions will have their hats, hat entries photographed on models with bare shoulders and, and bare collarbones. And this isn't me being a prude, I just think it's inappropriate because a hat doesn't exist in um, isolation from the rest of the outfit. So I don't know why you couldn't just find a, like a black shirt or a white shirt or, um, I don't know, something fun, like with a collar or, you know, so something that would complement the shape of a hat. I know that a photo shoot of like 20 hats, you want the model to wear the, the right kind of thing and be able to suit every hat but still I don't know just just a white t-shirt a black t-shirt or something with like a, a boat neck or something but I don't know it, it makes me uncomfortable what do you guys think let me know in the chat if you agree with me or maybe you disagree with me in which case let's talk about that <laughs> back to the book I, I, I didn't really notice this before about this book but it's been on my mind so I've just noticed it now 
and and it, it does annoy me a bit but it, it's no reason to not buy this book because this book is fantastic again I don't want to show you exactly how she goes through but I can show you what's in the book this kind of fascinator if you are interested in it with feathers now is she putting that feather together yeah she's putting that feather together that um, trim together from scratch so if you're interested in that then this actually looks really good again it's step by step it's easy I don't want to go through all the pages as I said so I won't um, show you every page but maybe like I did on the other book I can just read out um, a random oh this is this is cute isn't it look at this little denim colored cinema thing that looks really nice let me read out um let me read out a um a little instruction like I did for the other book so here we go this is step 14 of making that little denim hat thing this is this is how it's written pin the four loops towards the back and the left hand side of the cinema disc in a pleasing arrangement you may want to keep them as circles or squash them a little to make ovals when you are happy with the arrangement, sew them on using small sab stitches. See page 18. Very good. Good callback. Um, going all the way through the loops and into the disc. Put to one side while you make the rose, bud and leaf trim. So once again, I think that's very, very um, easy to understand, accessible, short sentences. I actually think the other book, the Hats on Heads, Mildred Annals arc, was written just slightly better um, as in like easier written but you get the photos in this one you get very very good photos right are you are you all discussing uh, um, uh, naked naked hats yes you are uh, Michael says new book suggestion hats for nudist colonies I mean yeah uh, once again wonderful application but maybe not for your everyday person looking to get into millinery uh, Anissa says, I agree with you. I think it's to make it sexy and attractive, but I'm more attracted to how to coordinate with a stylish hat and an outfit. Exactly. That is exactly my point. So maybe next time we all see someone post a picture of, um, uh, a hat with, with, uh, like a sexy collarbone, maybe we could say, do we really need to see this lady's collarbone? <laughs> Um, and Anissa says, maybe it's lack of imagination or they can afford the dress that goes with the special hat. And Michael says, yes, most people who wear hats plan them around certain outfits. So let's acknowledge that in the pictures. Exactly. And that's that's kind of what I'm all about as well, because, you know, we're living in an age where people aren't very. Not everyone has a hat, right? So in the Edwardian times, every woman wore a hat. You would not leave your hat, uh, you would not leave your house without a hat. And you um, certainly wouldn't leave your hat without a house. Um, but we don't have this attachment to our hats anymore. It's, it's like that, that side of being able to express ourselves has moved into other things like shoes, or just in general scarves and, and coats and, and blouses. And we express ourselves fully now but we forget the hat and if we're trying to get individuals everyday people normal people interested in hats then we need to make hats affordable that's number one that's something that I think is very important and I have realized it's very difficult to make hats affordable but um, maybe that's another picture you guys would be interested in about um, affordable hats versus couture hats and how they differ. And maybe you'd like to know how I price my hats. So let me know if that's a video you'd like. Um, so firstly, we need to make hats affordable. Secondly, we need to get people to understand how a hat can firstly express your personality, but secondly, accentuate your outfit because you can either mirror your outfit shape in a hat or you can like completely contrast um, your outfit with a hat um so yeah there we go rant over i'm glad i'm not the only one but um to give them the benefit of the doubt um anisa you say it's lack of imagination um or they can't afford to 
you know dress the models with the the dress that would go with the hat i i kind of agree with you but on the other side of that argument is i think it it is just as you say expensive to have an outfit that would match every hat if it's like a row of if you're photographing a row of 15 hats and you've already paid for the model the photographer the studio it does then become expensive to um also rent some dresses or something to go with every hat but just a as i already said a blouse white t-shirt black blouse or you know just just something something nice that goes with everything um right anyway <laughs> back to the books ah felt chilby ah you see this is what i was talking about with the where was it this one the fabric manipulation techniques book this this kind of trim you can learn how to do it from here but this one is slightly more complicated it's very interesting it's it's small bits of ribbon this is very good for using up your off cuts so i thought that was very clever and um you don't need a trilby block to do this um they show you how to do it on just a crown block which i think is very clever and in fact i have done a hat like this i didn't do it the same way as in this book but if you'd like to see my version of making a trilby bucket hat, because I didn't do it with a thing, I, I did it differently, um, then that video was called Making a Trilby Bucket Hat. And perhaps Matthew can pop that into the... Uh... <laughs> Anissa says she's wearing something and that's great. Yes, I agree. Ah, <laughs> uh, we're back to not wearing anything again. But um, this, is a, this is a wonderful little headpiece. This is a really interesting technique. Um, and in fact, I'm going on a course to learn how to do something similar. So but again, you could say, oh, why are you going on a course? You've got this book. This book will tell you how to do it. Yes, it does. But a book does not replace physical one-to-one -one teaching or even physical online one-to-one -one teach, uh, not physical. Um, the, a book will not replace the physical one-to-one -one teaching or online tutoring, mentoring sessions. So I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, there's a thing co coming up called London Hat Week, which I will hopefully vlog all about that. So for those of you who aren't able to be in London for London Hat Week, I will be vlogging about that. So you can feel like you're almost here with me. Ah, uh, this is the one from the cover. This is really nice. This is a parasizal button with some lace over it. So I think in the book she explains how to block lace, which is a technique that I haven't actually seen explained in any of the other books so again something something new obviously not a new technique but a new thing in a book and look it's really pretty how pretty is that so if you'd like to learn how to make this buy this book and a peaked cap and i think there's a pattern for this peak as well this isn't my favorite shape um i think it's a little too floppy but um it's made using leather so again what I like about the way the projects in this book are curated, they're very much thought about how the, Sarah and Rachel clearly wanted to give us an idea of here's what you can do with felt and now here's what you can do with straw and now here's a sewn hat and here's a feather hat and here's a hat without a block. It's, it's covering all the different types of projects that you can do with the same set of materials that's not that many. So again, if you are new to hat making, this is the number one book, get this book. Um, this is not sponsored, I'm not paid to say that, <laughs> I should mention, um, but I, I very much endorse this book. This is the book to buy. Right, the next book. This is, this is the one that came out literally a month ago or less than a month ago, but very recently, Contemporary Millinery Hat Design and Construction by Sophie Beale. I haven't quite gone through this book in as much detail as the other ones, so let's discover it together. And I shall give you my instant thoughts. So, instant thoughts of the cover. Interesting. Um, they've chosen to kind of um, add gloss to the lady's outfit. Um, once again, she is dressed wonderful. Um, but I think it makes for a very odd cover because you've got weird matte ribbon, but then glossy coat. 
and glossy hat. I like the glossy hat, um, but I think it would have been nicer if like all the black elements had been glossy. I just find this a little bit awkward to look at. I don't know about you, but there we go. The reflective bit and then just the um, coated laminated bit. Um, it's a bit dark. In fact, I think most of the pictures in this book lean more towards the grey side. So if you are very, if, if you enjoy looking at minimalism, um, and if, mil if minimalism as an aesthetic gets your brain thinking, then this book will be good for you compared to this one. Um, because I wouldn't call this, these, I wouldn't call these pictures particularly minimalistic. These are very technical pictures. Um, plain background, but well lit. Um, it, it, it looks like it should lean to the grain side, but it doesn't. All these pictures are very well balanced. But this one, The Contemporary Millinery by Sophie Beale, is even more minimal, I would say, than the other one. Right, let's have a look. What have we got here? Oh, this is the one off the cover. This is the fabric-covered wire brim boater. Oh, that's interesting. Right, three hats here. Is that a difficulty level indicator? Yes. Oh, is it? Is it a difficulty level indicator? Let's see. I think it might be. Okay, that's fun. I like that. That's a really fun element, having a difficulty level indicator. Like sewing patterns, you know, you, you get on the, like, um, like on Simpli Simplicity and Vogue and things like that, you'll get a difficulty level. This is great. Oh, look at this illustration. Oh, it's lovely. Okay, I am warming to this book. I just, a, a classic example of don't judge a book by its cover, because I really don't like this cover, but actually the contents looks really good. Look at this. This is stunning. I like that they've got the photograph and the illustration here. I think this is very good, because if you're trying to also learn um, fashion illustration, this will give you an idea of how a drawing can translate to a 3D object. Of course, not all of us think that way, um, the traditional way of, of millinery, we don't really tend to, we didn't used to sketch, but now if you're a milliner who's gone through a fashion college course, like at Central St. Martins or something like that, because it's a fashion course, they will get you to sketch. Um, so it's, it's just a slightly different way of thinking. So whether you prefer to sketch or you prefer to mold on a shape, this is very interesting. This is wonderful. Okay, let me read you an extract and we'll decide on whether this is well written. So this is going to be an extract from that hat that we just looked at from the middle of the tutorial. And apparently, so this is called Straw with Hand-Shaped Drape and Rolled Edges. It has a difficulty rating of two hats out of three, I guess. And this is towards the end of the tutorial, Hand Shaping the Trim. This style is created as a guide, so don't worry if it doesn't look exactly the same. You will find your own hand shaping style by letting the material lead you. Your work can be reshaped, so loosen up and see where it takes you. I very much agree with this advice. Actually, I, I really like this book already. Okay, um, um, you see, my, opinion, my opinions can change. Um, this technique requires a lightness of touch to avoid it looking forced, lumpy or tired. This is a sentence that actually we come across a lot in a lot of the vintage manuals about um, something called a milliner's touch. So you don't want to be heavy handed. So when you first start making hats and maybe you're working with some felt, it's really easy to dent the felt if you like, if you, if you squish your fingers too hard and you pull on the felt, you'll, you'll kind of create a dent in it. Obviously you won't need fingerprints, it's not like clay but you, you will overwork the felt and it will change its thickness because you've pressed it down on one bit, but not on the other. So having a milliner's light touch, that's, that's what this is talking about. It's about have that, having that control in your fingers, which you will gain with experience. You'll start by being heavy handed and then eventually you'll build up your confidence and you'll loosen up your fingers and it's like playing an instrument. You'll get there. Let's carry on with the paragraph. Try to work with the weave of the straw. You will notice if it is being pulled unnaturally, so don't take it somewhere it doesn't want to go. If this happens, try guiding it in another direction to keep it smooth. Um, try guiding it in another direction to keep its smooth bounciness. Make sure the straw doesn't become too wet and let it dry for a few seconds after each new movement to let it set. 
Okay, so um, longer sentences than the previous books, but very much what I would call a hand-holding manner of conversation. So a very conversationally written book, uh, very much um, almost like having a tutor with you in the room telling you everything is going to be all right. So if you're the kind of person who needs a little bit of hand-holding and a little bit of encouragement as you read through tutorials, I think this is the book for you. Um, let's see how many projects it's got in it. Actually, that's a good comparison, isn't it? Let's have a look. How many projects? Mm. Gosh, there's a lot of projects here. Oh, it is a difficulty rating. So let me show you the, uh, the contents page. Here it is. Hopefully that's all in focus. So this is the contents page. So you can see how many projects there are here. And that is indeed a difficulty level. I love this. I think this is my favourite aspect of the entire book. Right, let's compare this to the amount of projects in the um, Lomax and Skinner book. Where is the contents? Ah, look at this contents. I forgot to mention it. This is this is from the Millinery, the Art of Hat Making. This is another reason why I like this book. You know, we're, we're creative people. We're visual people. This is a brilliant way to do a visual contents because this tells me exactly where to go for what kind of hat. And in fact, you can definitely see here what I was talking about, about the different ways to work with different millinery materials. You've got the full spectrum here. So that's nice, but I think it is less hats than in, um, than, than in the Sophie Beale book. And then what else have we got? We've got the hats on heads. Let's see. You can see there's, there's quite a lot of projects here, but bear in mind, this side is essentially sewn hats and this side is blocked hats. So, um, yeah. We'll, we'll just put this one to one side because it's it's more, um, it, it doesn't quite fit in with the modern vibe. Right, let's see how many here and what does the contents look like? There it is. Oh, look, this is numbered. This is, this is very good. So 22, 22 projects in the Hat Couture book. And these are more advanced, I would say. So let's say we have a difficulty rating on these two books. If you're more advanced, then go for this book. If it's your first millinery book, then the Lomax and Skinner Millinery, the Art of Hat Making. And then uh, this one I haven't decided yet. Let's have a look. Let's have a quick look. The basics. Oh, these pictures are pretty, aren't they? They do seem slightly grey. Um, maybe it's just the printing. Um, or maybe it's just that when, like, when I take my images and I process them, I do like to up the brightness a little bit. Maybe I'm just used to seeing that. Look at that beautiful Melusine. My husband says, definitely something I don't have. I think referring to the light millinery touch, which is why I'm banned from helping. Oh, you're not banned from helping, my darling. I think um, we have had requests for videos of um, you trying to follow one of my videos to make a hat. Maybe, maybe that's what you could do with your time off. Right. Oh, I've just realised I've had no music playing for an indefinite amount of time. Never mind. Oh, well, we're, we're almost done with the stream. We've got one last special book to review after we've decided our verdict on the Sophie Beale book. Um, oh, she goes through types of blocks. But once again, this is stuff we've seen in the textbooks. So this is the textbooks, but with modern pictures. It's the same information. It's always going to be the same. Some stiffness. I mean, yeah. Mm, types of trim. This is all. Uh, this is all standard, standard, standard. Let's see. Uh, mm, okay. So types of stitches. I actually think that the types of stitches pictures are a little bit better in um, the Sarah Lomax and Rachel Skinner book. So I, I think because they've used black thread, it's actually a little bit easier to see. Um, but I do like the orange thread, obviously orange, my favorite color. But it's the, currently it's all the same information. 
absolutely identical. Upcycled straw hat. Well, that's a nice idea. I, I, I do want to make a straw hat. Maybe I should follow this to upcycle one of my straw hats. Oh, that's a lovely idea. Look at this. That is stunning. Those colours are very beautiful. So this is in a chapter called Sustainability. Hmm. Mixed media headpiece. So I'm guessing this is going to be talking about limiting waste, repurposing and upcycling. Okay. So, okay. Here's the thing. These two books, right, they are project-centred, um, but this one does seem to talk a little bit more about, um, so for example, making your own millinery and moving through a careful considered piece often leads to the creation of, treasure, of a treasured item. Um, it is an alternative to the mass-produced disposable market, blah, 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 all the usual sustainability stuff. Some ideas to consider swapping trims can refresh hats. Oh, okay, this is now, like, early 20th century millinery advice so if you've if you've read the 20th century millinery textbooks this won't be new to you but i'm really happy to see someone in the modern sphere trying to revitalize that not that it ever really went away from millinery but it did go away from our public attention um milliners have always been known to recycle reuse retrim refresh hats because hats are expensive so it's sometimes nicer to just get a hat and redo it but if that's the kind of thing you're into then maybe this contemporary book will um, help you with that but to sum up out of all the hats we've looked at today <laughs> what i would say is and the camera isn't zoomed out enough to show you this but if you want sewn hats find this you'll only be able to find it second hand as it's out of print that's this one hats per project remember if you are a complete beginner then you want millinery the art of hat making if you have a bit more experience then you want contemporary millinery by sophie beale and if you are super advanced and you want to learn from just a master then you want to go for hat couture by marianne yonkind so i hope that sums it up but we're not done yet. The last book of today's live stream. And I'm very, very excited about this one. If you've been to some of my previous live streams or videos, you will know that I have an obsession with a certain milliner from the mid-century. And that certain milliner is Aggie Tarup, whose hats you can see at the V&A, uh, the Victorian Albert Museum. So Aggie Tarup was a Danish milliner who moved to London. There is a um, YouTube video from British Pathé, uh, which is like an old video news broadcast thing about um Aggie Tarup designing hats in his studio and he just seems like so much fun and I love his hats seeing his hats at the V&A Victorian Albert Museum in London is part of what sparked my interest in making hats and when I realized this book existed I had to get my hands on it this book is so rare this is the only copy I found for sale in the entire world and it came from South Africa. So let's have a look at it. It's, it's very old. It, it was already packaged in um, this protective plastic coating, which I'm very glad about because otherwise, uh, you know, I don't really want to be handling this book too much. I love this font isn't it gorgeous it's like a um uh, a kind of arabic script style font it's it's very lovely look at that it's oh it's so nice so this book is written by aggie tarup um with dora shackwell in 1957 i'm guessing that was to just help his english a bit because i don't think his english was the best um 
Anissa says, that's really great when you have someone who inspires you this much. Yeah, yes, it really is. <laughs> Like I, you know, we all like Dior and we all like Chanel and that's all very well, but, but it purely in the hatting sphere, just hats, just Aggie Tarrup is, is really what does it for me. So you can see on the contents here, um, all these different types of hats. And I like, I really like how the chapters are titled. This is, this is almost like how I like to speak. I think this is also why I identify with this book so much. To make a straw picture hat, to make a felt cloche to make a felt fez, to make a fabric toque. I, I love that way of a written expression and speech. It's just so lovely. Oh, I've bookmarked something here. Let's see what I've bookmarked. Oh, look at this. Isn't this just gorgeous? These illustrations and the, the, the illustrations of the hands. And I think this illustration really does put across this idea of a light milliner's touch. This, uh, just the way the lady in the illustration is holding the, um, the uh, fabric. Um, let's read a little bit. To make a straw pill box. This hat can be made from a capelin, cone, straw material or straw braid. When made from any of the first three, it should be made in two pieces, a sideband and a tip. The ideal aid is a wooden ring. I have one of those somewhere in the cupboard. Shall we play husband bring the hat block? Husband bring the hat block. <laughs> oh, it's actually got something pulled around it. You might not recognize it. It's covered in some straw. It's 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 literally it looks like a donut. Giant donut. Um but as mentioned in the chapter on basic equipment, a substitute might be made from material and sawdust or a ribbon board could be used. The the language is a little more, you know, like prosaic i guess you could say it's 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 very much longer sentences but this this kind of hat i love the look of this did husband find the right hat block yay yes he did this is my ring block i'm, I'm still trying to figure out how to use it this didn't really work i think this is probably why i've got this bookmarked is i was trying to figure out if i could do this with this straw but this is the brim from a straw capelin and it doesn't quite um, move around. So it doesn't quite close. Um, Anissa says the illustrations from the 50s and before really sell the dream. They really do. They really, really do. Anyway, um, this is this is, I think, a failed experiment. I'm going to take this off and reuse this at some point. But I do want to make a hat from this book. Unfortunately... As much as I love Aggie Tarrup, I have tr I, I have read this book cover to cover through the tutorials just to just to get my head around how he thinks and things, and it feels absolutely impossible to follow. Like it, none of it makes any sense at all. But you know, us humans, we get blinded by fandom, and I'm 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 not I, I would not recommend anyone buy this book. Um, firstly, because you probably can't find it. Secondly, because um, it's absolutely useless. But it is by Aggie Tarrup, and I'm very grateful that I managed to find it and get my hands on it. And I will treasure this forever, even though the tutorials are impossible to follow. Because not only do I sometimes struggle understanding some of the instructions, maybe I should have prepared an example. Mm. <laughs> Wait, it, it is, you know how, um, oh, I think the internet's slightly starting to give up. Are we back? Yes. Okay. Um, so some of the older textbooks, you know, we had some fun chuckling about how they were written. Here's a fun sentence. I like trimmed hats. I believe, I believe that they suit most English women and that most English men like them. Isn't that adorable? Anyway, um, I was talking about how difficult they are to follow. Um, let, let me read you a bit of why these are so difficult to follow. In fact, oops, oh, sorry about that noise. That was me almost knocking over my mug. Right, I'll read this last bit and then we'll sum up. So look, this is to make a felt fez. For either method, first cut a paper or spartry pattern. Fine. 
it's got a diagram here. Um, as will be seen, the sideband, the sideband pattern is deeper than the hat appears in the drawing. This is because the top edge of the sideband is turned over softly and shrunk towards the center to meet the tip. Now, I kind of understand what he's going on here, but if you were new to hats, you would not be able to visualize this in your head, I think. I think this is very complicated. Um, the complete hat, when finished, should measure from side to side across the top approximately five and three quarter inches and from back to front six and a half inches. The tip itself will be only four, quarter, uh, four and a half inches by five inches. The oval at the lower edge will measure seven inches across and eight and a half inches in. You see, the way this is written, this will take a lot more sitting down with a notebook and pen making some notes about how to follow these instructions because I, I do think that they are impossible to follow. Anyway, that was all the books for today and we've managed to complete this in just about two hours. So thank you for joining me everyone. Does anyone have any questions about any of the books today? I've already given you my recommendations um, for what books to buy in what order if you are interested. Um, and obviously, once again, a reminder, you do not have to buy every single book that I have or I recommend. Decide for yourself what kind of um, learning method you prefer. Or perhaps you don't really like books at all, in which case you can stick to my YouTube videos, Rachel's videos from Labrica Loose, John's videos from JWH Millinery, and also Sarah's videos from SH Millinery. Um, and all of those links are in the description box below. Um, don't forget to leave me a comment, tell me what books you might like to buy if you're watching this not live and as a video on demand. And you can follow me on Instagram at Bialona Millinery. You can support my work on Patreon where my patrons and I just generally have a lot of fun chatting about hats. Um, you can also give me a tip on Kofi if you enjoy my work and would like to support me financially. Everything goes towards the technology side of making these videos. Um, have I missed anything out? Anissa says, that was very nice of you. All the advice and tips. Thank you so very much. You're very welcome. And um, thank you for joining me, everyone. Thank you for joining me live. Hopefully there will be a vlog video next Sunday, but as usual, no promises, just in case life gets in the way, because it can, but hopefully that will be out then. And um, there will be the fourth and final live stream, which I can't remember what topic the books there will be. Oh, biographies, milliner biographies. So for those of you who are history buffs and would like to know about millinery biographies to read, that will be the next live stream. And live streams after that, I don't know, it's up to you guys. Let me know, what would you like to see me do? Um, we can go back to blocking hats, we can try some techniques, or we can have some chats about general fashion, or I don't know totally up to you guys. But anyway, thank you so much for joining me live here on a Sunday and I'll see you all next time. Bye.